So Isaiah 53 continues. We're up to verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Wow. Okay. Jesus was not crucified because of his own errors or sin. He was crucified because of our sins and our sin uh, transgressions and our iniquities. So, you know, we are the ones who have gone astray from God. Jesus, as we said before, Jesus lived the perfect life. He never sinned. Even as a child, he never told a lie. He never thought evil thoughts. Jesus lived the perfect life because he was born of the seed of God. So, he, when he suffered, it wasn't because he was being punished. It was because he was taking the punishment that we deserve. So let's just look at what is sin. Sin is a, a archery term that is for missing the mark. So if you picture in your mind an archery target, there's the bullseye. The bullseye is usually red. Boom, boom. You know, you see you hit the bullseye. You hit the mark of the bullseye of the target. And so Jesus, you know, he hit the bullseye of the perfect life. But most of us, all of us, we don't hit the bullseye. Actually, every day we hit way outside the bullseye and sometimes we miss the target altogether. So sin is even in an archery competition, if someone hit uh, off of the bullseye or or missed the, the mark, then the um, referee of the archery match would call out, sin! You know, it's like, because you, you miss the bullseye. So we have sin. We fall short of the perfect standard of God. It's to be in error. It's to make a mistake. And even the Old Testament law in Leviticus, it has provision for unintentional sin. You know, sometimes we sin because we don't know any better, but that is not an excuse. It's just an explanation. An, ex an explanation doesn't make sin not sin. It's still missing the mark. It might be an explanation for why you missed the mark, but you still missed the mark. It's to not be righteous. It's to not do things God's way. It's to violate God's divine law or to fall short of the perfect standard of God. Jesus was put on the cross for our sins. And it says he was pierced for our transgression. So transgression is an act of sin. So sin is missing the mark, but a transgression is, you know, sin is like the, um, the, the borderline, but transgression is when you step over that borderline. You transgress. You, you like a trespasser who crosses over a property line. You, you, an act of transgression is crossing over that line. So he was pierced. He was broken. He was bruised. His skin was perforated, laid open. Like when you cut into a piece of meat, I'm sorry to be so graphic, but this is what happened to our Savior. We have to understand how brutal and how awful and how terrible it was. He was pierced. This wasn't a pretty nice day in the life of Jesus. He was pierced. He was broken. He was cut. He, his skin was damaged and wounded. He was bleeding because of the way that they pierced him. In addition, of course, we also know from the scripture that even after he cried out and hung his head it, with his last breath, they pierced him again and out flowed water and blood. <laughs> the living water flowing out of Jesus on the cross and his blood being shed for the forgiveness of the sins of mankind. Hallelujah. He was pierced because piercing is what we deserve. That torture is what we deserve for being transgressors against God. He was crushed for our iniquity. So iniquity takes it to a whole nother level. Transgressing, transgressing is the act of crossing over that line, but iniquity is in the heart. 
It's what you're thinking, your emotion, your will. It's your premeditation to do things. It's the thoughts that you think about even if you don't do them. It's perversity, depravity, mischief, bentness. I- iniquity is, is the things that are going on in your heart and your mind and your emotions that are outside of the perfect will of God. So, you know, people will say it's okay to be tempted as long as you don't do it. But that temptation might even be iniquity in your heart. If you're thinking about it, God, you know, Jesus raised the standard of what iniquity is. He said, you know, adultery with a woman is not just the act of having sex with somebody else's husband. Adultery with a woman is the same as if you look at her lustfully, you have committed adultery with her. Iniquity drives deep into what's going on in the heart and in the mind. So for iniquity, Jesus was crushed. Crushed is to be broken or beaten into pieces. Uh, I just, I'm so moved by what Jesus suffered on our behalf. He was beyond bruised. He was beyond destroyed. But you see how iniquity is at a deeper level within us. And so the crushing takes it to a deeper level of what happened in the suffering of Jesus. He was crushed. He was humiliated. He was oppressed. He was smited. He was trampled on. He was crushed down like to a powder. Now, Jesus retained not a bone was broken. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to take this somewhere where the Bible doesn't go. Jesus, not a bone of his was broken, and that is also in fulfillment of the Psalms. But I'm just trying to express to you the suffering that he endured. And because iniquity, he was crushed for our iniquity, it took it to a whole nother level. The chastisement, the chastisement is punishment. He received the punishment that we deserve, but because he was punished, we get to go free. So it's like, let's say you've got kids and one kid is behaving really badly. And that kid, it said, you know, go to your room. You say to that child, go to your room because you've you've behaved badly. So you have to go to your room. But your other child says, I will go to my room so that they can be free. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. We deserve the death penalty, but he took the punishment that we deserve so that we can go free and have peace with God. And it says, by his wounds, we are healed. So we talked about healing a little bit in the last segment. Healing is included in the gospel. It is included in salvation. I know that's not taught a lot, but it should be. It is all part of the package because Jesus paid for it all. When he He said it is finished. He also included this. And I'm not talking about just in heaven. People don't get healed in heaven because everyone in heaven is already whole. That's a whole different story. By his wounds, we are healed. And that means healing is available to you now. By his wounds, so his bruises, his stripes, the blows that he took, the hurts, the marks, and the strokes of sin, he was whipped and whipped and whipped. And, you know, there's a teaching, I've heard this, that people talk about that he was only whipped 39 times. No, no. Okay, people are misusing the scripture because it says in the Old Testament that if if someone is going to be punished by whipping or scourging, you know, to do it 40 times less one, which would mean 39. So I understand where you're getting that from. However, This is where that type of thinking is wrong. The Roman soldiers did not put themselves under Jewish law to restrict themselves to only 39 lashings. Heck no. The the law was put in place. God said among his people, if someone's going to be scourged or whipped or lashed, it's 40 lashes minus one so that your brother is not humiliated. The Roman soldiers, their total intent was to humiliate. 
Jesus was humiliated. We just talked about that in the last section of Isaiah 53. This was absolute humiliation and degradation for Jesus. The Roman soldiers did not stop at 39 lashes. They were just warming up by 39 lashes. Jesus was pierced, crushed, wounded. He took the depths of every penalty that we deserve so that we could receive forgiveness from the judgment and the wrath and the even even the right now afflictions that afflict us because of sin. So verse 6, we'll come back into that. All we like sheep have gone astray. We are the ones that were disobedient, not Jesus. Jesus lived the perfect life. We have turned everyone Everyone, no matter how great you think you are, you're just not. Every one of us is like a sheep that have turned astray to your own way. All of us, you do what's right in your own sight. And if you want to know how totally dangerous that is, well, first of all, look at the world today. And second of all, read the book of Judges. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own sight. You know, that's what got mankind into this whole problem in the first place. Adam and Eve did what was right in their own sight, and they lost the opportunity for life with God forever because they did what was right in their own sight. But all of us have done what is right in our own sight rather than doing what is right in God's sight. So therefore, the Lord God laid upon Jesus, Yahweh the Father laid upon Jesus the Son, the iniquity of us all, all the way to the depths of our hearts. The judgment for sin and transgression was laid upon on Jesus. And there's just a quick note there. Jesus is the eternal peace offering. If you are a Bible geek and you love the, the book of Leviticus like I do, you understand that Jesus didn't just fulfill the righteous requirement of the law as far as behavior and moral conduct is concerned. He also fulfilled the sacrificial requirement of the law. Now, I do not divide those. Some people say there's the, I forget even what they call it, but the law is not divided. Divided. It's one law. Anything that says the law is divided, that is doctrine of man. I do not subscribe to that. Jesus fulfilled the whole law, including that he offered himself as the peace offering before God. That is the fulfillment of Leviticus 3. You can look at that on your own time. But because he was offered as the sacrifice for the peace offering, his sacrifice brings us peace with God. So we are continuing with Unit 3 of the Gospel is the Power. Unit 3 is the Word of the Cross is the Power, and we are on His cross, the suffering servant, our Jesus, who suffered and died on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins. So we've been talking in Isaiah 53, and we're going to pick up right where we left off, which is Isaiah 53 and verse 7. He was oppressed. He was afflicted, but yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to slaughter, like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut out, cut off, out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. We'll pause there. Jesus suffered. And we touched on this before. You know, Jesus being on the cross, it looked like the enemy was winning. It looked like the Roman soldiers or the authority of Rome, it looked like they had more power than him. Just think about that for a moment. 
This is really important for the times that we are living in in our world and the times that are just ahead of us before the return of Christ. We have a Savior who gave us an example of what it looks like to suffer for obedience to God. He was oppressed. He was afflicted, but he opened not his mouth. When Jesus stood, so, you know, Jesus, he didn't try to change the world by scheduling an appointment with Caesar, who was the most powerful guy in the world at that time. He didn't try to schedule an appointment with Pilate, who was the governor of the the region, or with Herod, who called himself the king of the Jews and who also had authority from Rome over different area. No. That's not how Jesus was going to change the world, and that's not what his kingdom is about. It's not a political kingdom. When Jesus stood before Pilate and Herod, he was already on trial. He was already condemned by the Jewish people as a blasphemer, and when they interrogated him, he opened not his mouth. He made no self-defense. And there are teachings out there today that will say, you know, oh, well, but that doesn't mean, you know, like the, the teachings of Jesus, that, that only means, you know, if someone doesn't hurt you. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Jesus said, turn the other cheek. He was not being metaphorical. He was being very literal. When he said, go the extra mile, that was very clearly in that day and in the context of that culture, a Roman soldier could take anyone from any nation that Rome had dominance or governance over, and a Roman soldier could command any person to walk 1,000 steps with their armor and gear, no matter how heavy it was, the person they selected would have to walk it 1,000 steps. That's actually where we get the term mile from, one mile. And so when Jesus says, go the extra mile, he's saying, if a Roman soldier commands you to carry their heavy armor equipment, the same tools that they use to oppress you and punish you if you're wrong— if you have to carry those those tools and, and battle gear one mile, actually make it two. He, he says, love your enemies. Jesus demonstrated through the cross. He lived out in living demonstration the teachings that he taught his disciples to follow. And we need to take that very seriously in the times that we live in. We will be called upon to turn the other cheek. We will be called upon to go the extra mile. We will be called upon to love our enemies, to see if our lives are genuinely given over to the one who was given over to death for us. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Jesus was oppressed and afflicted. This is how he worked atonement and salvation for us. Hallelujah. Oppressed. Oppression, it means to press or to drive, exert a demanding pressure, to be, you know, hard pressed by a ruler or a tyrant. Basically, being oppressed, you're under someone else's control. You don't get to make your own decisions about what you'd like to do or how you would like to see things go. If you're in an oppressive relationship, that person is dominating. That person, you always do what they want to do. And then if you don't do what they want to do, then there are consequences for it, whether there's physical harm or manipulation or there's backlash or something like that. That is an oppressive relationship just on the person to person relation. But in a nation in or with a people, an oppressive regime, when there's governmental powers that take away the rights of the people, that is oppressive. So oppression is you're, you don't have the freedom to make your own decisions. 
Jesus, he was oppressed. He was put under someone else's control. They took him as a prisoner and led him to his death. He was forced by the Roman soldiers to carry his own cross, even unto his own death. He was afflicted. So he was humbled, bowed down, to be put down, to become depressed or downcast, to be humiliated or browbeaten. He's afflicted. You know, he there was damage done to him. He was cut off. And this is significant. Daniel says um, in Daniel chapter 9 that the Messiah would be cut off off, karet, from his people. So Jesus is cut off through death. He died. It's important. It's significant. He did die. It's not that he was on the cross and then didn't die. You know, there are some crazy false teachings out there. Jesus really died. He was cut off off of the land of the living. He was stricken. So every force of the curse was laid upon him on the cross. So to strike in the biblical sense is to, with a, with a, a plague or a a spot or a wound or a disease or a mark. So like someone would be stricken with leprosy. Someone would be stricken with a plague. So the full force of the curse of the law, all of the punishments, including the sickness, including the torment, including the plagues, including every affliction, you know, was put upon Jesus on the cross. He was stricken and he was slaughtered like a lamb, like an innocent, spotless lamb. He was led to slaughter. And that word, again, I'm sorry to be brutal, but the The cross was brutal. The root word for that is to butcher, to slay, or to kill ruthlessly. Ruthlessly. He was butchered. He was beaten. He was slain for us. This is what Jesus did to provide the atonement for our sins before God. So through that, again, you Bible geeks, this is Leviticus 4. Jesus is the sin offering that is offered. He is the fulfillment of the sin offering offered to atone for our sins before God. So we'll we'll come back up to verse 9. They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. So we've covered this. Jesus was not the one who did anything wrong, but they counted him as if he were a wicked man, even though he had never told a lie in his entire life. Jesus was judged as the sinner, even though we are the ones that are the sinners. Jesus was judged as a criminal, even though we are the ones who are criminals against God. He was judged like he was a wicked person, even though we are the ones who are wicked and sinful. And just in the fulfillment of this verse also, we know from the Gospels that a man named Joseph of Arimathea uh, had a grave. Joseph was a rich man, and he had a tomb. And when Jesus was taken from the cross, Joseph and you know wrapped him up and put him in the grave. So Jesus was did fulfill this scripture even to those details. God never misses a detail. Jesus was put in the grave like a rich man in his death, even though he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. <laughs> 